On this edition of Independent Sources, Felons Unbound, are communities of color ready to deal with a record number of prison inmates returning to their neighborhoods? And neighborhood superheroes, small comic book publishers give ethnic characters a chance to save the day. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. There's been a lot of focus lately on how America's prison system has disproportionately hamstrung the country's black and Latino communities. Now the issue is being refocused as the Justice Department prepares to release 6,000 federal inmates by the end of October. It's part of an effort to reduce overcrowding and roll back some of the harsh penalties given to nonviolent drug offenders in the 80s and 90s. This is raising questions as to communities' readiness to accept these felons and curb recidivism. I spoke with NYU professor Nikhil Singh about the issue. So, uh, Dr. Singh, the Department of Justice is set to release about 6,000 inmates uh, by the end of October. Is it going to come a time when they, they pick uh, 5,000 inmates and just say, you know, you're free and that's it? My sense of the process right now is that pretty much at every level of the criminal justice system, uh, there's a move to decarcerate. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be based upon people's existing sentences. Mm -hmm. and they're going to be looking at every way of shortening those mm -hmm. based upon good behavior, based upon uh, assessments of risk, and so on and so forth, internal to the system. Mm -hmm. I'm not privy to those kinds of sure. judgments, okay. uh, not being a corrections official. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but um, I don't necessarily have confidence that there is a clear plan okay. about how this is going to unfold. Okay. I think they have their targets, they have their numbers, and. Uh, um, these are being driven by all kinds of exigencies that are internal to the system, right? Sure. Do people have uh, reasons to be fearful? Uh, are we talking about hardened criminals? Or are we just talking about people who were, you know, over sentenced? Uh, should, how should the community react? The, the bigger issue really is how do we think about this process and how do we think about how we've gotten to this point? Well, answer right? that question. Um, <laughs> well, uh, you know, we've had the evolution of a system of criminal punishment that has spiraled out of control. Uh, it has re largely replaced um, the kinds of social supports that we used to see as essential to helping people to make good lives. Mm -hmm. um, not 30, 40 years ago, we had an understanding of crime itself as something that was conditioned by social causes. And if you look at the people who are in prison, um, you, can, you can discern some things very quickly about them. Often they suffered trauma as children, violence as children. They grew up in conditions of poverty. They grew up with a lack of educational opportunity and social support as they, uh, as they developed. Um, as they came to adulthood, they were often in situations where there weren't access to good, high-paying jobs or to a pathway to greater success and affluence. Well, so, speaking of that... So all of those things condition a situation in which someone then ends up in prison. But we tend to evaluate this solely in terms of whether someone committed a crime mm -hmm. and as a moral individual failing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's our failing as a society, sure. that we no longer examine the causes that place people in a situation where they wind up inside the criminal punishment system. That's a very good point, I agree. But uh, what's the uh, correction system doing to help the, train these people that they are about to release to the general population? Uh, are they uh, helping them, tr are they training them so they can get jobs when they come out? Uh, well, see, this is, here, here's, an, here's another dimension, really, of the problem, right? So we have this, this criminal, criminal punishment system that grows over the last 30 or 40 years, and at, even as it grows, internal to that system, the supports that might help people inside it are being removed. So you have the elimination of college and prison programs, the elimination of Pell Grants, the elimination of access to education. Of course, there's still some state-mandated programs, uh, especially in New York State, where 
uh, people in prison are able to get their high school diplomas and are mandated to get mm -hmm. their high school diplomas. So there's some there's some limited uh, opportunities, and I, I certainly know from the facilities that I've worked with in my capacities running a prison education program that um, there's planning for discharge, there's some family reunification programs, uh, there's some counseling that goes on, and there's state mandated uh, programs uh, for uh, to help people with issues of drug addiction, are, are with they, issues of uh, anger, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, so that there there are things that go on within the facility that are that are meant to remediate some of the the, the problems that people mm -hmm. in prison have. But in terms of training and preparing for life outside, I would say there isn't a great deal mm -hmm. beyond what I've what I've what I've listed as mm -hmm. far as I know. Are there community organizations uh, who are working and, and able to? help a lot of these inmates uh, back into uh, communities. Um, in, in New York City, in New York State, there's the Osborne Society, the Fortune Society, there's smaller community-based organizations like the Center for New Leadership in Bed-Stuy. Um, there's the Vera Institute. There's many, okay. no, there's many nonprofits who are interested and concerned about how to connect people coming out of prison with the social services that they need. Mm -hmm. The primary things that people are going to need coming out of prison are housing, employment. Um, they're going to need often uh, to reestablish some kind of a productive and positive support network, uh, interpersonal network that's not, um, that's not going to pull them back in to uh, negative behaviors, uh, and, and then in addition to that, then a pathway to, uh, to new opportunities, mm -hmm. which, which would most logically be through education, okay. uh, in my view. Dr. Singh, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Still to come on the show, boot camp for women dealing with domestic abuse. Before that, Abby Ishola has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. The Bronx Free Press reports on a new residence specifically for LGBT youth with a history of homelessness that's opened on Jerome Avenue in Bedford Park. The dwelling is called True Colors, where tenants pay subsidized rent in accordance with their income. The residence features studio apartments built by nonprofit West End Residences. That company previously established a successful LGBT housing facility in Harlem. Occupants are offered support services that include case management and ongoing assistance with every aspect of independent living, as well as a range of additional services, including GED classes and access to health care. From Sing Tao Daily, the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce and Chaya Community Development Corporation recently announced the launch of Flushing Lending Circle. It will be a joint program that helps new immigrants and small business owners get informal loans while they establish their credit records. Chaya Community Corporation is a Jackson Heights-based nonprofit entity that mainly serves South Asian immigrants. It is the first organization in the city to launch the Lending Circle program. The entity has already raised $16,000 to offer zero interest loans to new immigrants in the circle. The open source gallery in Park Slope will feature Backdrop, the stories of Kurdish guerrilla fighters told through a video installation and photography. Kurdish artist Savas Boyras and his collaborator Martin Nordstrom came together to tell the stories of the war to establish a homeland for Kurdish people. Their work explores internal struggles of those fighting in the war and Boyraz's relationships with the subjects. Kurdistan is an area that is not a country, but a region spread across Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria. It's inhabited by the Kurds, a group considered to be the largest ethnic community without its own country. Backdrop will be on display at the Open Source Gallery from now until November 1st. That from the South Slope. And finally, She Rose is a new exhibit that seeks to highlight the work of female comic creators and their characters. The collection of art from numerous artists is currently on display at La Casa Azul in East Harlem. Regine Sawyer, an artist herself, is the founder and curator of Women in Comics NYC Collective International.
She hopes to inspire appreciation, not just for women who work in comics, but the industry in general. What we do is we go into the community, we have panel discussions, we do workshops, um, just a full educational series um, to talk about women and comics and um, how uh, different communities can embrace that type of uh, work and career. As a marginalized community as a, as a whole, um, women have not been promoted the way they should be as in terms of marketing and seeing their faces. So it's been, it's been a, quite a road in terms of equality and all those different things that come with that, especially in terms of women of color. So they don't really get out there as much. We don't see them as much. We see more um, of a white male dominated um, industry. So this is just our way of saying, well, hey, we're here. You know, we matter too and we work really hard and we love what we do. The She Rose exhibit will run through November 22nd at La Casa Azul Bookstore. Those were just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be right back. Thanks for staying tuned. Bootcamp for Women dealing with domestic abuse sounds rugged, but it's actually all about creating a safe and nurturing environment for women who have been brutalized by their partners. The former FDNY captain, Dawn Diaz, is the founder of Milagros Day Worldwide. She uses this boot camp as one of her many tools to help women through a most trying time. Zyphris Lebrun sat down with Diaz to learn more. So Dawn, thank you very much for being with us today in studio. Thank you, Cyphus, for having me here. All right, so let's start uh, and talk a little bit about what you do. Um, you've started the Dare to Dream program and the Legacy Boot Camp programs. Tell the audience a little bit about what those uh, programs are all about. Yeah, so they all fall under the umbrella of Milagros Day Worldwide, which is a nonprofit organization that empowers survivors of domestic violence in a very unique way because we're based on leadership, with a leadership approach. And the programs, um, some of them are Dare to Dream, which is a workshop that we bring to all different groups and organizations just to give an introduction of what we do and really to get people to start thinking that, you know, they're, they're, they're worth whatever it is that they want to have in their lives. And, um, and then the boot camp is specifically for survivors of domestic violence or childhood trauma, where we take them away on a three-day retreat to have all different types of challenges. These would be spiritual, emotional, physical, and just really to you know completely change their life in three days. Mm -hmm. So what, um, why did you decide to create this organization and have these different programs? Well, Milagros in Spanish means miracles, and um, that's my mom's name. And my mom was a victim of se very severe domestic violence, and I was a, a young girl growing up in that environment. And so I know how that damages a person, and it was just something that I always felt like I wanted to do something about, and I'm, you know, very fortunate that I'm able to actually make that a reality. Okay, now I want to go back to the, the boot camp. Um, and you said in three days. So kind of walk me through a little bit. Um, what are some of the activities you mentioned? What are some of the, the ways that you try to get to these women to, to get them to deal mm -hmm. with their trauma? Yeah, well, first of all, it's a, a sisterhood. So we begin to create a community, and that happens from the minute that they get on the bus. So we actually charter a bus from New York City, and we take them up to the mountains, whether it's Pennsylvania or New Jersey or upstate New York, and have them begin to connect with each other as to why they decided to take this, this, this trip. Um, and so that immediately creates bonding. Um, after that, we, we want to take them away from their everyday routine and give them complete, uh, you know, full immersion into being, into giving themselves a break and also giving themselves a chance to, to explore. Um, and then we do some really deep activities like the, uh, like taking your, things that you want to leave behind and, and burning them in, in, in a ceremony. And then we do a forgiveness ceremony. We do the flight of freedom, which is a physical challenge. So, you know, there's, there's really just all kinds of ways that we have them look at what they've been through and where they want to go from here. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that we've done stories on the show about domestic violence in the past, and it seems that the issue 
kind of, you know, it gets the hype when something happens, like when an athlete, you know, something happens with an athlete and their spouse and so forth. Do you think that the consciousness about the issue is where it needs to be or has it, does it flag? Does it, mm. you know, wax and wane? That's a great question. I'm really glad that you brought that up. Uh, you know, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, among um, other women's issues months. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the attention comes up when it's th the month to observe that or whenever there's a, a major incident in the news. And obviously we know that this happens day in and day out to many different families, regardless of social status, economic, uh, educational, and so forth. You know, one statistic that really, really hits home for me is that up to 10 million children a year witness domestic violence in the home. And, and that is continuing that, that negative legacy throughout the generations. Um, and so, no, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's something that it has enough attention. And also, I think it, it doesn't have the, the uh, adequate attention. So when I say that is, you know, let's look at something different. Let's look at different approaches, right? So instead of focusing on crisis intervention, what's next? What happens when the system leaves off? And that's what Milagros Day provides is that leadership component. Mm -hmm. Now, are women becoming more comfortable coming out to talk about, you know, when they've been abused or, or faced abuse in, in their relationships? So do you think you get the sense that they're more comfortable coming and talking about these issues? Well, I mean, historically, we have evolved, you know, as a society. Uh, I mean, technology has evolved and, and all of that. So looking back from, you know, 50 years ago, it's definitely leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. However, there still are, we still have a long way to go. Um, I, I, I feel personally, just in my interaction with, with a lot of women, um, you'd be surprised that I think that women that are that are more successful and wealthy and and educated are less prone to come forward because they feel like they have so much more to lose. Right. Um, but you know, I, I think that we're we are making progress, and and I think that if we focus on the possibilities rather than the problems, that I think we'd make we'd you know move forward a lot faster. So you're saying like the, the so you're thinking in the case of the, the post of the event or, or preparing the women more mm -hmm. so to how to come forward, you know, and say, hey, listen, this is something I faced. I feel more comfortable dealing with that. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I think it's, it's actually after women have made that choice to get out of, a, of an abusive relationship, you know, they, there's so many vital services that are available to them now. And those all include, those all encompass crisis intervention. You know, so so they need to have those in place, but they definitely need something after that. You know, so something to 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 fill their soul. You know, um, definitely you know career counseling and financial counseling and things like that, but also spiritual you know, um, fulfillment. And that's not religion. It's just like who you are in the world and what is your role? Like, what is the impact that you're going to make in your community? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what do you find is probably one of the reasons, the major reasons that women stay in these sorts of relationships in, in your own experience mm -hmm. with, uh, with these women that you deal with? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, there's a hashtag. It's called why I stayed. Um, yeah. It's not mine, but it's something right. it's something that I encourage a, a lot of women to look at to see all of the different reasons why um, I can say to you that, you know, me as a third generation survivor, why I stayed was because I didn't feel that anyone else would want to be with me. You know, as ludicrous as that may sound, being intelligent, being attractive, being educated and all of that. But a lot of women have that that low self-worth. Right. Um, I mean, why they stay financial reasons, why they stay, because they want to keep the family unit together, all of those things. And and so, you know, the women that I work with, that's one thing that I say to them is, you know, as a child growing up in domestic violence, believe me, keeping that family unit really is not the best choice, you know. Um, and it's a difficult decision, absolutely. And I always say to women, it's not going to be easy. 
by no means is it going to be easy, but it's definitely worth it. All right. So for persons who may be watching this, who may be interested in your programs, how can they reach out to you and, and find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, so our website is milagrosday.org. And also um, there's a, a phone number they can also call, 718-496-7050. All right. Well, Don Diaz, pleasure meeting you. Great talking to you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. When we come back, since shattering, Augmented Reality Comic Books. Droves of comic book fans recently descended on the Jacob Javits Center for the 10th annual New York Comic Con. Convention organizers say more than 165,000 people attended the event, a far cry from when it was confined to one hall at the location. Zyphus Lebrun covered the convention and filed this story about how smaller publishers are trying to ride the wave of geek chic and bring more characters of color to comics. While comic giants DC promoted the upcoming Batman vs. Superman film and Marvel their forays into animation and their new line of comics, the minnows of the industry were hard at work selling their stories to a curious but cautious few. The book is called Legend of the Manta Maji and it's a story of a shallow, conceited district attorney of New York who finds that he's the last in a race called the Manta Maji that used to protect us from the forces of evil. So he's the last person you ever want to be a hero, has to defend us from an evil sorcerer who's been resurrected in New York City and is posing as a religious leader. I have a comedy book coming out. It's called Sun Lar. It's a buddy comedy. We have an alien who gives uh, this drunken fry cook in East L.A. powers, and so he becomes kind of a bumbling idiot. So it's these two going on adventures. Uh, the superhero is trying to get the best shoe deal he can possibly get and get fine wine and loose women, and the alien is not having any of it. So Jamil Hemphill and Eric Dean Seaton were just two of the small publishers at this year's New York Comic Con, trying to get their piece of the 10% of the sector that independent creators like them represent. They both agree that it's tough selling people on characters that are not Superman or Spider-Man, but Hemphill says that's changing as the audience becomes more diversified. In my tenure as making comics, I've noticed that the clientele has gotten more diverse at these cons. And I think that's helped me. Um, when people see characters that look like them, they want to buy them. Diversity has become a big buzzword in comics these days with the success of films like Captain America the Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy. That's legitimizing an industry once considered too infantile. David Brothers is the content manager at Image Comics, one of the largest independent publishers. He says that it's up to small publishers to be more experimental with their content. It's tough to make a new character work in superhero comics because people want Spider-Man, Batman, Superman. And I can't blame them because those are great characters. But by shifting away from the superhero thing, that your opportunities just widen. Creators like Miriam Awan, who's a school counselor and therapist by day, are doing just that. I've heard students time and again come in and say they want to be superheroes, they want to be Spider-Man, they want to be Superman. And it, it's heartbreaking for me to try to convince them that that is not an attainable role. Awan's book also wants to empower women. It focuses on a group of female fighters from around the world who are trained in various martial arts and are on a quest to find out why guns have disappeared from the earth. The strength of women is usually accented still in this industry through superpowers, and they have to have something that's not really attainable. So combining women and diversity was a huge part. Another huge part for publishers like Anthony Fletcher is to speak to his audience on their level. I've noticed like with kids and teens, adults are always talking down to them. And here I want to embrace their intellect and talk up to it because we have to trust them to make decisions of their own. We don't tell them what to do. We want them to figure it out. Fletcher's creation, C Squared and Posse, features a futuristic multiracial group of inner city kids who are fighting an intergalactic horde bent on world domination. He wants readers to have fun with his comics and wants to teach life lessons as well. I want people to be able to see themselves in what I'm doing, especially if you're doing futuristic stuff. If you're doing futuristic stuff and you're not representing other people, what are you telling those people? That they're not going to be in the future? You know, it's not real. 
What is very real for these publishers is the need for continued support from an audience that may be more comfortable with a formula that some may say is more tired and trite than tried and true. Zyphus LeBron, Independent Sources. While roving the convention halls, we also ran into an Australian immigrant who is merging media and creating an application called Augmented Reality Comics. I designed an app that works specifically with my book. So when you've got the app on your iPhone or your iPad, you just point the camera at any page and the page comes to life with animation and sound. So here you can see this page here. Just a printed page there, and then I look at it through the app and the guy is moving. There's also an extra layer of text. So this story is about a paranoid time traveler. This is like his private notebook and all the secret information he hides inside the app. Well, I was doing a comic series called Knowles, which is a web series, and it's all about augmented reality in the future. Then one of my fans happened to get in touch with me, and he happened to be a really hardcore programmer, and he said, you know what, we can actually make some of that that you talk about in your story. And I was like, okay, let's do it. And then this is what happened as a result of that. It's available online at my website, which is modernpalaxis.com. Finally, what's Comic Con without cosplay? The practice of dressing as your favorite hero or heel. We'll sign off tonight with a call to the costume cavalcade. My name is Andrew Jaklowski and I am a cosplayer as Green Arrow. It's the second year that I've been doing it. First year I kind of eh, and then this year I was like, okay, I'm trying to make it look a little better. I love to dress up like this for like children's hospitals. I do it sometimes when I have work but because people like to do it. They like see it and like kids think you're a real superhero. It's really cool. Why did you choose this character? Ever since Captain America, uh, she really spoke to me as a character, so once she got her own show, I started watching it, and I think she's a great role model. I love to see other people dressing up as characters that they resonate with, especially other strong female characters, and I think a lot of people see themselves in the characters that they dress up as. I am Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's my absolute favorite character, um, and so I wanted to kind of do a, a take on her character, but still be authentic to myself. This is a very intricate scarecrow costume. How long did it take you to make it? About three months, and towards the last couple weeks, a few sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. 